Let's put a hand together for the worship team. Did a great job. That was awesome. It was very thrilling and, and uplifting, um, which is very fitting with the subject matter I'm going to be talking about today, which is death. But honestly, guys, that was fantastic. Great job, everybody. Excellent job. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Robin, uh, and everyone who's joining us online, uh, good morning to you. And if I haven't had a chance to cross paths with you and introduce myself, we'll, hopefully we'll get a chance today. I was about, um, I was about 12, either 12 or 13. Anyone 12 or 13 here? Oh, uh, I, saw, I saw some cheeky folks. Want to get in on the young, the young life? Not that easy, guys. Any 12 or 13s? Okay, there's a few here. Okay, and my mom, my mom, uh, her, her co-worker's son had passed away in a snowmobile accident. And so uh, my mom wanted to go and support her co-worker. So she brought me along to a wake. She said, you know what, I think I want you to come and see this. And from the best of my recollection, I think this was definitely by far my first experience with a funeral or a wake. And so I went along with my mom. I remember going in there, and there's a few people kind of, you know, milling in and out. And you've been to wakes. Um, I'm assuming most of us have at some point. And they, they can be kind of grim. Uh, it can be really sad. There's usually somebody or a few people kind of teary-eyed or, 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 or consistently sobbing during those times. And I went with my mom to, uh, to, to the front where they actually had a casket, and the casket was open. And there, the son was there, he was in the casket. And, um, and I remember I was doing one of these, right? Because there's just something about it that it's such a sacred moment, and, and, I, and I've never been here before, and I don't know how to deal with it. So I'm walking up to the casket, I'm doing one of these. Because the casket's over here, I'm doing... You know, it's like you don't want to get too close and you don't want to look it directly in the eyes because what if it looks at you? You know, like, you know, like all these things are going around. I'm, t- I'm 12 or 13, right? All these things are going through my head. I watch too many TV, too much TV. So anyway, I'm here, I'm looking at it, but I'm so interested. And you know what I'm interested in? I wanted to touch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... I, I don't know what relative it was, but there, there was a relative that was standing nearby, and she said, she knew it. She, she just knew it. She could see it in my eyes. She could see this, right? She's like, do you, do you want to come up close? Do you want to come up close and touch the body? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so I go up to it, and I just kind of go, you know, just kind of just... You know, and I don't want to poke too much because what if he wakes up, right? So I'm just like, <laughs> and, and I'm talking, and I'm just, oh, and just so unnerved. Uh, I'm telling the story because y- you have also at some point in time, and if you haven't, you, you will possibly experience what it is to see death up close, to see the shell of a person left behind, but their spirit is missing. You know, we have the... We are a spirit with a body, not a body with a spirit. So I'm there, I'm looking at the shell, and I'm touching it. And I just remember the solidness of the body and just realizing there's no one there. And the finality of that moment just stuck with me. I I really believe it was one of the key reasons why I came to faith at 17. Because I've experienced the finality of death. That there is an end that death is coming and we can all experience this and, and, and am I okay, am I, where am I gonna go afterwards? And if, if, if that person's no longer animated, then where's the spirit or the soul that was in there and what's gonna happen to it? And all those things are in my mind. You know, it's, it's really fresh for me in a lot of ways too because um, I've had three uh, people in my family pass away of late. My great aunt passed away um, only just about a month ago. Uh, and, and I shared with you previously that my one aunt passed away and also my grandmother passed away all this year. So this uh, topic of death is fresh. 
And I don't want to treat this with too much contempt because I know it's close to so many of our hearts. And it should be because we're all experiencing death. We're all experiencing it. And the truth is that we will all die. And this happens because the wages of sin is death, right? When Adam sinned, he took of the fruit, he ate of it. What happened? Something came into his body that enabled his body to expire. It enabled him to expire. He now an expiration date, and now all of us have an expiration date. And we're aware of that. And also sin that's inside of us is also aware of that and likes to remind us that we have an expiration date, likes to remind us of our infirmity, of our vulnerability. And so not only are we experiencing death in our bodies, so you are slowly expiring. I know that because I woke up this morning and I could feel it. You know, there's certain parts of my body that don't work as well as they used to. You know, um, you know, any kind of activity, you know, I kind of feel it in my knee, I feel it in my, you know, my ankle, I feel it in my hip. Some of us are closer to experiencing that than others, obviously. But not only are we experiencing it in our bodies, but we're also experiencing it in our minds, so the flesh is taking advantage of that and is telling us all the things that we should be afraid of so that we could self-protect so that you don't die. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, everything that the flesh directs us towards to protect ourselves is actually slowly killing us. And that's sin's goal. That's what the flesh wants to do, wants to destroy you, not only in body, but in your mind. So we're all experiencing death, and we will all die. But in Psalm 49, this is a passage we're going to be looking at today. Psalm 49, if you have your Bibles with you, you could open up to it. Um, Psalm 49 It's talking about death and talking about the the power of death, how death is a great equalizer. And I'll explain that in more detail. But verse 20 of Psalm 49 says this. And actually, if we could if we could go to that, guys, if you want to go to right to verse 20, if you want to open that, put it up on the screen. This is the last verse. There's only 20 verses in this chapter. And the last one says this: man in his pomp yet without understanding is like the beasts that perish. Man in his pomp. Pomp, another word for honor, another word for wealth, another word for high standing. All of our successes, everything that we dream that will make us happy, known, seen, understood, loved, everything that we can achieve on our own ability is worth nothing. Even if we have everything that we wanted, we are still like the beasts that perish. Beasts that perish can be translated very simply as (laughs) roadkill. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, LeBron James, I can name off all kinds of people with honor who have money. Everything that they have, all their successes, the Bible says that they are none other than roadkill. Yet without understanding. Let's pray, and then we're going to jump in. We're going to find out what this psalmist is saying about what this understanding is. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much that death is not the final word. We know that, but the threat of it is there. So I pray that you would inspire our hearts so that we can experience your life even as we learn about death. Pray this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So let's take a look right now at Psalm 49. So if you have it open, let's just read along together. Or actually, I'll read and you can read uh, read in your heads. So Psalm 49 says this, zero, Psalm verse zero, to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Hear this, all peoples, give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. Let's pause for a second. This is to the choir master, so this is actually a song. This is a song. This is, this is such an important song that God decided it was going to be in the Bible so that we could learn from it. This, is, this, this is just speaks to the, the importance of the theology of, of, of art and music. Um, it just says so much about that. But anyway, here we go. So hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. 
My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. In other words, a harp. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. That he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid. I just want to say the stupid's in the Bible. Sorry, it's there. The fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever. Their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. What an encouraging psalm. Thank you so much for encouraging us today, Pastor Robin. Can we go home now? Um, listen, there's so much here. This psalmist is, is, is writing about what it's like to live in an agrarian society and have those who have more wealth live beside you. So they probably don't have the same type of rights that we have in our, in our laws and our countries. And so somebody who's far more rich, far more powerful, who has larger um, uh, larger cattle, larger group of cattle, a larger group of land to create vegetation, this person has more power than you, so they can encroach on your land. And so this guy is afraid. He's speaking about the fear of what it is to be weaker than somebody else. He is experiencing death. Because he feels the invulnerability. He feels like if someone takes away my livelihood, then I will die and my family will die. He's experiencing death. But he says, why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surround me? And this is his reasoning, right? Because he says, there's a riddle that I'm going to answer. And this is, this, is a, this is how he answers it. He says, truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. That he should live on forever and never see the pit. What's he saying here? He's saying the cost of a human life. You couldn't put enough money together to prevent someone from dying. You cannot earn enough money to prevent yourself from dying. You can earn enough money to prevent it for maybe a certain point of time. Maybe you can take care of your body a certain way, maybe a certain kind of products you could use or a medication you could use to prolong your life. They said the longest living person was 122 years old in modern history, 122. That's a whole lot of McDonald's they did not eat. <laughs> You know, like, like that's, that's as long as it gets. But think about all the wealth in the world, trillion, quadrillion dollars. There's nothing that you could pay to stop this from happening. What is he saying? Death is the great equalizer. Rich or poor, white or black, wise or stupid. Whether you trust God or you don't. Nothing's stopping this thing. Sin Burst in us, breathes in us death, and there's nothing that could stop this thing from happening. Nothing could stop the train. So in other words, he's saying, why would I fear then anybody when I have a much greater adversary? Why would I fear someone beside me who can, who can harm me with their words or, or harm me by or taking money or, or wealth away from me when the fact is that death is far more powerful? Why would I fear them? He's making a very good point here. Steve Jobs in his autobiography, or, or no, sorry, in his, I think it's his biography, uh, he, he, he was getting closer to, uh, he was actually doing some treatments for the sickness that he had, the illness that he had, and he was, and the interviewer was asking him some questions about death. Steve Jobs is the creator of Apple, very wealthy man, and, uh, and he was talking with the, this interviewer, and the interviewer was asking him questions about, you know, what do you think about death? Because obviously it was very near. And Steve Jobs said, you know what, the more I think about it, I did not add an on-off button on a lot of the early 
uh, renditions of some of my computers that I had because there's something about that on-off switch that I just couldn't deal with. There's something about that that reminded me about death, the finality of death. And so I kind of wanted to ignore it for that reason. And so I think it was stated that some of the earlier on MacBooks didn't actually have it very, like, very apparent. You had to go like, look for how to turn it off. Listen, even in all his wealth and power, the finality of death was very apparent to him. He was afraid of it because he realized that nothing that he could achieve could prevent this thing from coming. Psalm 49, verse 14 says this, Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. We're going to come back to that. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. This topic of Sheol is this waiting place. It's the place of the dead. So they talk about the Old Testament. If you see in the New Testament, it's the term Hades. We know that there is a final judgment. There is a, a lake of fire. And we know that that's at the very end. But Sheol is an in-between place. It's that waiting place for that. But we in the resurrection have a much different story. We're going to talk about that, aren't we? So Psalm 49 verse 15 says this. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. This is a very important phrase here. Anytime you see that but God, especially when you're reading the scriptures, it's very important. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. Now think about it. That topic of wealth has been what we've been talking about the whole time, right? Does man have enough money to pay for themselves to live forever? Well, no, they don't. But here, the psalmist has a very important artistic kind of ploy to bring us to something that's of great attention. And it's this, that the power of sin that produces death is great, but God is greater. The power of sin that produces death is great, but our God is greater. He says, God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. This word even here, in when he says, for he will receive me, that word receive is actually used in the Old Testament phrases when we're talking about Elijah and Enoch. If you know the story of Elijah, right? He gets taken up into a fiery chariot. And God just takes him away. We also, have, we also hear about Enoch, who didn't pass away. He just went with God. God took him. He's using the exact same words here. This psalm is saying, I, I, I just, I don't know how, but I know that God is good. And if he is good, and I trust in him, and I don't trust in men, I don't trust in wealth, I don't trust in achievements, I don't trust in my own successes, I don't trust in my own ability to save myself, that if I trust in God who is good, then he's gonna save me. I, I know he's gonna do it. I, I, I know this. And look at this word of faith here. This word of faith that he's expressing, he doesn't know about the resurrection, but God honored his faith so much that it's been put in scriptures for us to read now, for us to be blessed, and to see the power of what Jesus has done for us. God honored his faith. But God will ransom my soul. Talk to me now, good Christians. How did God ransom the souls of humanity? What, in what way did he do that? What, what payment? Because we're talking about ransom, right? Because it's a payment. What payment was made to ransom our souls from Sheol? Anybody? Jesus. Jesus. That was too easy. I should have made it harder. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was, I should have made it harder. Jesus. That was the price that was paid. Yes, we will experience a physical death. We will all physically die. And yes, there was a spiritual death. And here's another thing. Death wasn't exactly what God intended for us. It was something, unfortunately, that Adam chose for the rest of humanity. But God will take something like death and turn it into a good thing. He will take that and turn it into something wonderful. Our spiritual death means so much to our, to our journey as, as believers. But our physical death is not the end. In the same way, it is not the end. 
There had to be a ransom for our souls so that we could be rescued then from the power of Sheol. Now, what was the price? We say, Jesus, that's great. We all know that, but let's take it into consideration. If there is no financial terms by which you could live forever, you could not see Sheol. If you couldn't, if you couldn't make enough money to rescue yourself from there, then there had to be a cost that was greater. There had to be a higher value. Consider this. You are worth an uncreated value. You are worth an uncreated value. The life of Jesus. The world thinks if I make enough money, I could save myself, I could, I could, I could raise myself up, I could make something of myself, and they're all with created things. Money and, and cars, all things will pass away. But the value of your life is an uncreated thing. You are worth the blood and the sacrifice of the life of Jesus Christ. That is your worth and your value. You are of great, great worth of value to God. And that is, again, the only thing that could actually save us. Only his sacrifice could have done it. And this is very important for us to understand, too, because Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says this, that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously Give us all things. Consider your worth in Christ. Consider the fact that you are worth the life of Christ. Even within that, we're living this life here. We're experiencing death in our bodies. We're even experiencing death in the barrage of things from the flesh in our minds. We can trust that he that gave his life for us knows what our journey is and will help us walk through the struggle of that. That even though our bodies are passing, our inner man, our inner person is going from glory to glory. We're getting strengthened every day by his care and provision. Let's keep reading on. Psalm chapter 49, verse 16. It says this. He goes on to say, Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go down to the generations of his fathers, who will never again see light. And then here's where we get our final verse that we were talking about earlier. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. So what's this understanding then? The psalmist makes it very clear. It's trusting in God, not trusting in your own ability, not trusting in wealth, not trusting in what you can do for yourself. It's trusting in God only. The greatest human achievement for any of us is trusting in Jesus for life. The greatest human achievement that anyone could have is trusting Jesus for life. Everybody say this with me. I am a success. I am a success. Okay, I could do a lot better at Anthony Robbins. All right, everyone here to say it with me. Right? Say it with me. I am a success. I am a success. Yeah, you, you are a success because there's nothing on this planet that you could do to earn what you have now in Christ. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The wages of sin is death. So you earn death by trusting in the flesh, by trusting in your own ability. But it was the gift of God that you received that now qualified you to live eternal. When, when we pass away, we go, we, we go right to where we are currently, which is seated with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 says that. We are seated with Christ right now. And so we get joined with him. Death is not the end. Matter of fact, Paul says death is gain. Paul says even death is gain in that sense. But to live is Christ. The time that I have here is to accept the fact that I'm here to serve, to, to, to allow him to live and express himself through me, to invite others to know this same miracle and gift that I have received. Because to die is, to, is a gain, is to be with him forever. 
and to be with him now. You know, I, want, I was thinking to myself about this. What are, what are some of the things in my life that I consider a great success? I'm going to be so real with you right now. I'm going to be so real. You know, when I was growing up, I used to watch a lot of movies, and i get really excited about certain films. And I'd be like, you know what? One day I want to be a director. I want to be a director and, like, direct a movie sometime. And I see people, like, getting Oscars and stuff for directing movies. And I was like, man, I really want to do that. Like, that would be really great. You know, it would be a great achievement. And now I've matured, and I've grown up in a lot of ways. And now, I want to win a Grammy. <laughs> I mean, what's an Oscar anyway? <laughs> what's that? You know, but those things cross my mind. I'm like, man, that would be a really cruel cool success. And if I had that, well, how would I feel? Well, I, I don't know, maybe I'd feel at rest. Maybe I'd feel better about myself. Uh, maybe I'd be kinder to everybody because I finally achieved something, you know, and think to yourself right now. You're laughing at me, but be honest with yourself. What is that level of success and achievement? What is it, what law have you set in your mind of I am qualified, I am worthy of rest, I am worthy of experiencing life to the full when I achieve X, this thing? What is it? Think about that thing. And then also consider this. If you had it, what would you experience? Would you experience rest? Would you be happier? Would you be more joyful? Guys, the fictitious, the fictitious game that the flesh plays with us, that the world plays with us to make us think that any kind of success in this world will bring us rest, is totally unfair. And what it does is it just puts striving in our hearts that wears us out. But instead, here's the truth. You are already a success. You have the highest achievement that a human being could have. What does that invite you to? The exact same rest that you can even imagine. And even beyond that. Because God wants to do above and beyond what you can imagine. So you've been invited now, just like Matthew 11 verse 28 says, to come to him, all who labor, laboring for success, laboring for achievement, laboring for approval from somebody or something. Some of us are even laboring for the approval of people who have passed away. Parents who didn't do their jobs. Parents who didn't let us know that we were okay. We're living under the law of somebody who does no longer exist. God says, release that burden. Come to me, all of you who are weary and been laboring, and come to me and find rest. Experience the wonder and the majesty of being a child of God. And what does that release you to do? See, you are free to serve rather than perform because it was the gift of God. It was nothing that you could earn. So it's not about being a really good Christian now and all of your performance within that. One of my life verses for me is Romans chapter 7, verse 6. It talks about how we are free to serve in the newness of the Spirit. So every day I consider, okay, listen, I, I, I've, I've achieved the greatest achievement there is. Okay, well, how does that change anything for me? Well, it does this. It makes me realize, okay, that if I have that now in Christ, then what's the next step? I get to open up my life to whatever God wants to do. If my life is in Christ, if Christ is my life, I open myself up to whatever he wants to do. And the Holy Spirit is creative. The Holy Spirit is, is, is creating new things for us to do, new ways to, to, to bless and work through us into other people's lives. And I get the privilege of allowing the Spirit to serve my family in a new way every day. And I have the privilege of getting to serve my church family in a new way every day because there's a new way the Holy Spirit wants to do it. And then I get to bless my coworkers by allowing Jesus to serve through me also in a new way every day. And what does this do? It invites people into the same experience of experiencing Jesus, an invitation to trust in him so that we no longer put trust in our own abilities but accept this great gift so that death doesn't have the final word. 
Death will not be the final word for those who trust in Jesus. But God will take that and turn it into something good. You know, I'm, I'm thinking now about, huh, did some rock climbing uh, with some friends. Uh, we, were, uh, we were at uh, a, a camp, and then at the camp, there was this big lake, and so you could take a canoe out to an area where you could do some rock climbing. When you get to the top of a certain precipice, then there was an area where you could actually jump into the water, and so you could do some cliff jumping, which is pretty fun. And we're talking about death, right, and the fear of death, you know, and right now, in this stage of my life, uh, I would never try something like that because I fear I have too much to risk, you know? But at that time in my life, I was about 20, 21, you feel pretty invincible. So we're going out there, you know, we're rowing out there, and we kind of climb up to the area, and we're jumping off. We're, we're, we're going to where the area is, so we kind of rock climb to the top of it, and you get up top, and it's like, okay, now if you jump off here, well, one of my friends says, if you jump off here, you see the dark area? That's safe. But if a little bit to the left, you'll die. <laughs> like, like, it's just like, that's, that's all somebody needs to know, right? <laughs> Is that, that, that just a little bit to the left, and that, that's it for you. And I see, I see my friends doing it, I'm thinking to myself, I am not crazy enough to do this. Like, it's already, but, you, but I've already committed, right? I already rode, right? Nothing like Peter here, right? Like, Peter's going all the way, like, running and biking, all this stuff. I'm complaining after just rowing for a few, for a few minutes and climbing a rock, right? But here I am on the top of this thing, I'm like, I don't know. And I see my friends doing it, so just peer pressure, I'm like, let's do it. I'm gonna jump off. So jump off, and, you know, you hit the water, you go down, and... I, I, actually, I actually remember at one point, I did kind of touch the bottom, but yeah, there was enough time that it, was, it wasn't going to do any damage, and I came back up, and I thought, wow, that was exhilarating. That was so cool, right? And so we just kept doing that over and over again, and then we rode back. You know, I remember, I remember thinking to myself, um, I am so thankful today on the way back, I remember thinking, even when we were there, I remember thinking to myself, I'm so thankful today that I had, at this point, chosen Christ. Because it was great to have this time with friends. It was great. It was phenomenal. But more than anything, I know that if something happened to me, um, whether I died or didn't, I knew of the comfort and the blessing and the intimacy of a relationship with Jesus. And to me in that moment, that was all... And, I, and here I am thinking about this, and I'm just feeling the surge of the presence of God. Just, I have everything I could ever wish for right now. And even in experiences, I'm experiencing it, it was like God reminded me, this is a taste of heaven. This intimacy with me, it's a taste of it. It's a, it's a preempting to what you will experience. It's a here and not yet. And I'm so thankful that you're with me, and I'm so thankful that we're together. And even in that moment, I just felt the emotion to cry. But I was with guys, so I didn't cry. <laughs> you know? But, but just feeling that and sensing that, and just knowing the intimacy of that, of what I found in him, and just knowing that it was more than enough. It was all that I needed in that moment. So here's the thing. Kids, don't do life-threatening things so that you have an experience with Jesus, okay? <laughs> but death doesn't have the final word for us. Uh, we have the blessing of the here and not yet, where we can experience him, and then even to die is, to, is gain. But we have a limited amount of time here where, as, with Christ as our life that we can experience him, but not only that, invite other people into that same experience in how we serve and how we treat others. Here's the reminder. Yes, the power of death is great, but our Jesus is greater. He is phenomenally greater. And you are worth the life of Jesus. You're not worth a created thing like money. You are worth an uncreated thing. And if you've chosen that gift, that is your value and your worth. Today, receive the blessing of your identity is being bound and formed in him. Receive the blessing today that you are a beloved child of God. Receive the blessing today that you are a success. That the greatest achievement any human being can experience, if you are in Christ today and you are trusting him for life, you 
have it. So step into rest. Embrace that rest. Don't wait till your final achievements or whatever you set in your mind to achieve that you may never achieve, but instead rejoice and relax in the wonder of what you've achieved in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the wonder of the blessing of being able to be joined with you, and I thank you so much that I have that, and that's just awesome. Um, but I get to experience that in each and every one of us here. And so I just pray for the empowerment of Jesus at this moment. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would empower us and remind us now in our souls and in our bodies. Let us feel it and know now, like your word says, that we are your adopted children and you are our Abba Father and you've come to care for us and protect us. And we receive your love and your care. That you, Father, did not even spare your son. So if you didn't spare your son, you can give us all things. Is there anything in the list of things and needs that we have that you do not know? And it's not the case. So we trust in you for all of that. In Jesus' name, amen.